Good evening. My name is Arielle Moon, and on behalf of the Harvard Museum of Natural History, I would like to welcome you to this evening's program, Ecology and Spirituality. In today's program, we'll have a chance to hear from graduate students from Harvard's Divinity School, who each feel a connection between ecology and their own spiritual practice. The students will share a bit about themselves and then engage in a group discussion. We have reserved the last 20 minutes for audience questions. And now I'd like to introduce Natalia Schween, who will be moderating tonight's discussion. Natalia is a Master of Theological Studies candidate at Harvard Divinity School, studying ecology and spiritual practice. She is a practicing herbalist, wildlife rescuer and rehabilitator, and environmental advocate. Welcome, Natalia. Thank you so much, Arielle. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, quickly, I just want to express my gratitude to Arielle and to Barb and to the whole team at the Harvard Museum of Science and Culture and to my brilliant classmates uh, for joining me today. I am so grateful to share this space with the three of you. And um, I'll kick us off and then pass it on. Um, so as Arielle said, my name is Natalia. I am a Master of Theological Studies student, a candidate for graduation this year at Harvard Divinity School, where I have studied ecology and spiritual practice. I am, a, I am a practicing herbalist, a wildlife rescue and rehabilitation apprentice, an environmental advocate, and I am also the assistant program director for the Program for the Evolution of Spirituality at Harvard Divinity School, which supports the conversations and scholarly study of marginalized traditions emerging in alternative spiritualities and belief systems on the larger edges of major religious systems. So my work um, functions within the assertion that our belief systems dictate our realities um, and that they are the foundation of our worldviews, even if that worldview is secular or non-religious. So these worldviews are the basis for how we understand our role on the planet, how we understand who is considered a person with rights in that world, um, even how we engage with the planet and other beings on the planet economically, from conscious consumerism to plastic use, uh, to the way that we garden, the way that we manage our lawns. Um, so if we believe that the planet is a hierarchy of species, rather than a cooperating, cooperating system, we will act accordingly. And generally our own species, humanity, will be viewed at the top of that pyramid rather than as an integral part of a larger system. So my research has focused on breaking down these boundaries between the human world and the natural world and exploring how our belief systems help us to see that we live in an integrated ecosystem and that we're part of an ecosystem. So I have focused my work on animism plus humanism and expanded understandings of personhood from the way that we interact with our pets to granting legal rights to aspects of our landscape. Um, so for example, there's a movement in Thailand where environmental activist monks are ordained trees in order to protect them uh, and protect their mountains from deforestation. So what is animism? Animism is a cosmology or belief system that makes room for a very alive world in which personhood and agency are not only relegated to humans. Uh, it's very culturally specific, even individually specific, but the, a very basic definition um, would be the attribution of souls to plants and animate objects and natural phenomena. Posthumanism builds on this worldview. It's a kind of anti-species, so um, anti that there is one way to be a human. Um, so instead of ending, understanding a person or uh, instead the understanding of a person or a human is abundantly diverse. And post-humanism often focuses on AI and how we might connect technology uh, within our integration um, in our bodies and in our lifestyles and how that affects our relationship with the planet. Um, so what pulls all of my these ideas and my work together is that everything exists in relationship. So remembering that all things, all beings exist in a web of relationships. Everything from the pen on your desk to the notebook comes from a body. And the lifeblood of our planet is in the very plastic of a window frame, uh, the, which are the bodies of sea beings laid to rest 300 million years ago um, in the smooth curve of your favorite plastic pen or 
perhaps also the tree that forms your desk. Um, so every particle is derived from a natural source, even our to-go coffee cups. And if we drink the liquid and toss the cup itself as discarded remains, the cup will continue in a landfill or in the ocean and might even outlive your own life or my lifetime. Um, and its life, its existence will continue to engage with non-humans in relationships uh, beyond the minutes spent in our presence, the minutes that defined its purpose in our ecosystem. So we need to be considerate of that as we engage in how our understanding of the world uh, engages with the natural world, especially in the age of climate change. So even the terms animism and posthumanism emphasize some sort of singularity for our species, some sort of exceptionalism, um, which I believe and many um, belief systems also believe is incorrect. And so I look at how we can break down an anthropocentric, which is to view humans at the center of all things or at the top of a hierarchy? How can we break down that hierarchy and recognize relationships? Um, and so a big part of that for me is looking at foundation myths. Um, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. It's um, There are many interpretations of the same foundation myth, same foundation origin story. Um, but that origin story is usually a way in which we can direct ourselves to how we understand, sorry, my dog is chewing on a bone really loudly, speaking of non-anthropocentrism. <laughs> um, so that usually helps us to understand relationships between our species and our role as humans. Um, um, and so my hope is to engage with individuals, with groups um, around their belief system and how that relates to sustainability and how they can engage with aspects of their belief system, because every belief system, every tradition does have an ecological component, even if it's not the primary um, primary goal or primary uh, method of practice. Uh, it still exists somewhere. Um, and so helping people to engage with that and to um, work towards building uh, building a more integrated, more holistic, healthier, and more sustainable relationship with their environment, with their ecosystem. All right, so that was a lot. <laughs> I'm gonna pass the mic off to one of my colleagues um, and then we'll each go around and give a little brief instruction, introduction before we begin a discussion around some of the through lines in our um, in our research and in our, our interests and in our spiritual practice. Um, so I will pass the mic over to Quinn. Thank you, Natalia. Um, hi, everybody. Very happy to be here with you today. Um, my name is Quinn. Uh, I am a first year MTS student uh, at the Divinity School. I study traditional medicine uh, practices uh, with a focus in the United States. Um, I generally focus on African-American, uh, Afro-Caribbean, and Indigenous American practices. Um, I, so I grew up sort of in urban and suburban settings my whole life, but I'm a huge nature kid. And so a lot of my practices and um, thought involve ways in which we can um, connect to the natural world, despite usually being in, in apartments and in, in houses that are uh, generally made up of, of plastic and, and you know, sheetrock and whatever. Um, and so that leads me to the sort of conclusion, uh, the initial conclusion that the, the body is the primary uh, biological system that we deal with every day, um, even when there's not many others around, right? Excluding sort of pets, house pet, uh, house plants. Um, the body is the, the main biological system you're going to be working with. Um, and so to that end, I, I sort of, um, I was thinking about practices that I do um, that, that connect me to the natural world that I would consider spiritual. And honestly, the thing I, first thing I could think of was dreaming, um, which is like my primary practice. Uh, I spend eight hours a day with my eyes closed with just me and my body. Um, so I figured that's, that's, a, that's a practice in and of itself. Happy to talk about that. Um, I, was, I also practiced uh, or practiced Qigong and, and Taoist energy cultivation techniques. Um, these are sort of uh, contemplative internal medical traditions um, that focus on sort of looking inward and sensing your own body and interacting with it. Um, I'm also a runner. I also just got into surfing. Um, I'm in love with it. Lots of enthusiasm, very little skill. Um, but uh, I, I, I really enjoy the opportunity just to just be on the ocean, even if I'm not surfing well while I'm there. Um, I think where I intersect with Natalia and a lot of my other colleagues is, is in my work with uh, indigenous plant medicines. Um, 
and sort of central to, to working with plant medicines in the indigenous worldview, um, and I'm using the term broadly for now, but I can be more specific later, um, is that uh, natural actors are seen as collaborators and teachers. Um, you're in constant relationship with your environment and the different um, actors in that environment. And uh, the relationship is, is you know, multivaried. It changes, um, uh, as I said, uh, collaborators and teachers. They can also be adversaries, um, friends, relatives. So uh, interacting and understanding yourself as a, a being of relationship with other beings, um, whether that be a plant, uh, an animal, specific plants and animals, um, even natural features, right? A waterfall would count, even though that's like a concert of biological systems and, and, and less biological systems, right? Rocks and water. Um, so to that end, um, understanding and exploring the way that these epistemologies inform the way we move about the world, we move about medicine, um, can, can yield some really incredible insights about uh, uh, how, to, how to interact with ourselves and with our surroundings. Um, so I think my long-term goals involve building bridges between different medical communities um, and, and also cultivating a sort of medical sense outside of what we understand as institutional medicine, right, Western medicine. Um, as I look towards a career in that field, um, I'm, I'm hoping to sort of help uh, alleviate some of its shortcomings and, and help people get a sense of medical sovereignty, um, you know, with those shortcomings in mind. Um, so with that said, I'm going to uh, introduce my, my friend Sakiko to come on next. Thanks, Quinn. Uh, my name is Sakiko. I am a second year divinity school student. I study ethnography, which is a qualitative method, research method, and waste in Arabic language. I am from a rural Japan. I've been in the States for about um, 18 years or so. I came here after high school. Um, anyway, at the Divinity School, I study waste and how people are affected by waste. I am curious how things or people become unwanted and even toxic sometimes, um, even though things and people are very much part of um, one's life. I am um, curious by waste. Uh, uh, unwanted things uh, like a piece of paper, uh, cardboard boxes, um, bread bags, furniture, clothes, tattered or not, or coffee grounds. Lots of feelings come up uh, around waste, I noticed, um, like relief, uh, disgust, anxiety, fear, and comfort. Um, for how much we interact with waste and are affected by it with lots of feelings, um, the information about where waste goes or how it is dealt with somehow isn't readily available. Um, so which this makes also me curious about where, um, how waste management information is communicated and not communicated and also imagined. Uh, with this curiosity this academic year, I've been hosting a weekly waste talk series inviting environmental engineers years, recycling business owners, design professor, Harvard staff, to understand waste and demystify waste and explore what waste can be. The point of this gathering is to meet with the person who operates um, how landfills, uh, operates landfills, recycling facilities, incinerating facilities, and I directly ask them questions. So how does this relate to this title, this talk of um, ecology and spirituality? Um, actually, I don't always think of these terms um, as like what I study, but I often crisscross with the people who relate to these terms. So a part of my exploration at the Divinity School is to see what terms or ideas or practices uh, I do with ways that other people may translate or think as ecology and a spiritual spirituality. So instead of ecology, I may think about the surrounding and the season, um, yeah, and then, you know, the type of waste that comes up in, in like a particular season changes. And then it, depending on what surrounding I am at, it things that I see or hear or feel or smell is different. Um, and then also instead of spirituality, I may think about walking, um, experiencing and listening. And I'm particularly interested in listening to silences. I like to think about um, what are the voices I don't hear? And it, or what are the things that I don't see? 
And with that, I'll turn it over to Jess. Thank you, Sakiko. I was writing as you were speaking. You got me taking notes. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jessica. I am a second year Masters of Divinity student at Harvard Divinity School. I also have the great fortune of serving HDS as one of three chaplain interns this year. Uh, at HDS, I study the intersection and overlap of embodied theology in non-dual Shakta Tantra and in Christian mysticism. So I'm interested in ways in which these two traditions, one of which I was born into and the other of which I feel has adopted me, uh, how each of these understand the body, a body, my body, your body, as a vehicle, throne, experience, interaction of and with the divine. Uh, and I, I self-identify as a, a novice and a learner in this space, particularly among my colleagues and classmates. Uh, I have been experiencing, I am in the midst of experiencing, I think a kind of awakening within my own spiritual practice that calls me in a way I've never known to the natural world. Uh, and I'm leaning toward it, leaning deeply into it. And uh, Natalia, I think, really graciously invited me to come with and, and be with her and with all of you and, and talk about it. Uh, I am experiencing within myself this beautiful, remarkable, relentless desire to put my body into natural spaces. I want to take my shoes off and, and put my feet in the dirt and put my hands in the dirt and listen and feel and be with what is what is coming up uh, and mm -hmm. and to understand the way in which I am a member of the, this community and not the center to some of Natalia's language earlier. Uh, and so typically my my spiritual practice has looked a lot like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a yogi, I'm trained as a yogi, and so I spend a lot of time moving my body through space, I spend a lot of time working with my breath, and I've been practicing more so how I can invite the natural world into my spiritual practice. And so sometimes, like my colleagues, that looks a lot like spending time in nature, uh, often with my shoes off when it's not too cold and I can stand it, because I'm a bit of a wimp when it comes to that. Um, at least right now, the, the days are getting warmer. Uh, it also, in a large part, means for me spending time with tea. I have a dear friend who is a tea professional who has allowed me to expand my understanding of working with this particular plant, Camellia sinensis, as a teacher, uh, as a co-creator, co-conspirator in my spiritual practice. And so I am pretty regularly uh, brewing a bowl with leaves and water and being with the experience of the tea, with the lessons that it has to offer me, with what it has to teach me about the earth from which it came, the earth to which we both return, we all return, and how that can be of use for me in my work as a spiritual care provider, as a writer, as a scholar. Um, I think a lot about the ways in which we use spiritual practice to uh, decolonize. And so I'm interested in the ways in which I can and we can understand the natural world as not just the location, but again, a sort of collaborator in spiritual practice and how we can decolonize our relationship to it, decolonize our bodies, decolonize the world, decolonize spiritual practice. Um, Tantra, for those of you who are unfamiliar, I mean, I, I can speak uh, a very little about my understanding of my particular uh, lineage, right? So my particular lineage, Sri Vedra Tantra, holds this idea that all things all things, all humans, all objects, all places, all senses and experiences are manifest goddess, specifically, our manifest divinity. This is an idea that is actually not new in Christianity, but I think has been whitewashed, has been erased from Christianity, and I am interested in exploring how it can, no pun intended, be resurrected, how, how like what the spaces are for either or both of these traditions to allow for our understanding of existence and specifically existence within the natural world to be full of and with divinity. 
So that's a little bit about me and my work. I would love to invite my classmates and colleagues back into this space so that we can continue our conversation. Mm, that was so beautiful. Thank you all so much. Um, I just love listening to the three of you talk about your work every single time. It's, it fills me with joy and encouragement. Um, so I'm going to lead us into our discussion before we move on to our question and answer uh, period with our, um, with our wonderful audience. Thank you again for being here with us. Um, so I was going to start with talking about some of our threads uh, of similarities, and we will talk about that. But I think it might be helpful, um, since we've each synthesized our research and our, our, our spiritual system, um, to provide, and we have a little bit already done this, but provide three practices for our audience um, if they're interested in following up in some of uh um, some of what we've talked about within their own world, providing three practices that we engage in that may be beneficial for them to consider engaging in their own practice. Um, so I can go first, but someone want to jump in? Okay. <laughs> um, so my three practices that I would offer, um, the first really has to do, really, I mean, all three of them have to do with this, but the first that I would encourage is getting to know your local ecosystem. Um, and the basis in that is fits in with what all three of my brilliant classmates have talked about, which is listening and observing and being still and being present. Um, but it also has to do with education. And I don't mean that in a higher ed sense. I mean, if you're out in your yard and you're looking at a plant, find out who that plant is, find out what that plant's role is within its ecosystem, their ecosystem, uh, what that plant's uh, medicinal, nutritional, um, mythological roles are, and just start to sit with them and get to know who they are are and what they're doing in your space, uh, which is also their space. And so how to, um, I, I find that that, at least in our, in Western herbalism practice, that's the beginning of developing relationships. So the tip number two, which um, fits in with this is find your plant allies, find your allies who you identify with in the natural world, who you take comfort from, who you take strength from, and be a part of making sure that that being is healthy and taken care of in the ecosystem in which you are living within. And it's great to get involved past that, but sometimes when, especially in urban environments, we really have access to very small spaces. Um, and so what can we do for the plants, the animals, the, um, the land around us in a way that engages in relationship and honors their role in that ecosystem? Um, and third, I would say, hmm, perhaps I would say reach out to your local wildlife rescue rehabilitator, a local herbalist, local conservation groups. Um, you're, and especially look at who, uh, what nations, what indigenous nations um, live on the land in which you live on. Um, and how can, you, how can you support those organizations? How can you learn from those organizations? How can you learn from the indigenous nations in your area on how to engage with the land in a healthier way, um, in a way that uh, validates uh, a holistic system? Um, and that's like, again, like I love to rant about landscaping, but like, it's so easy to shift from monoculture landscaping that's built on 17th century aristocratic standards that's absolutely unsustainable. It's really, it's, it's a matter of, I mean, easy, I understand that's a complicated word, but it's at least uh, a, a beginning um, into, into developing relationship with your land and into honoring, honoring the space. Um, and there's lots of nonprofit organizations in the area that can give you tips um, or feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to give tips. Um, so yeah, those are my three practices. I, I will pass it on. Who wants to go next? I can go next. Thanks, Natalia. Um, I, I also want to say, like, I see some really great questions coming in the Q&A, so I'm so excited when we get to sort of, like, open it up a little more. Uh, so my first practice, uh, and, and I suppose this is less of a recommendation and more just like, a, here's what I do if you want to do what I do, but by all means, chuck it over your shoulder and don't do it, uh, is, is having a cup of tea. Uh, and I would invite specifically, or, or when I brew tea, I like to brew loose leaf tea. Uh, I less it, it's less processed, right? There's less machine on the leaf between the leaf and my bowl. And that is also actually quite useful for me because there's less 
caffeine, quite frankly, is, is sort of released because the tea hasn't been like chopped up. It's not um, like, I don't know the right word for it. I've read it recently, but it's it's more whole. I've recently taken to like pulling leaves out of the bowl when I'm finished and sort of spreading them out on my desk and then taking a photo of them and like consider, oh, like this is what the oolong from this region of of uh, this province looks like, or this is what the oolong from this part of Taiwan looks like, or et cetera. Um, and so the one thing that I like about having tea this way is that it makes me go slow. Uh, we live in a world that makes us go fast. And we are all students at a school that makes us go fast. I was going to be a little kinder about it, but the truth is HDS, Harvard, makes us go fast. Um, and so going slow feels like a radical act. It feels like an act of resistance. And so when I, when I brew a cup of tea, I, I try to be really deliberate about each gesture, about the sound of the leaves hitting the bottom of the bowl, about the weight of the vessel in my hands, I'm about to pick it up to pour, about the sound that it makes when, when the, the leaves and the water meet. Um, and the, I, I pick it up and sort of we breathe together, right? So I breathe into the tea and the tea breathes into me and we have a conversation that way, with, with, like through air. Um, and so it's it's beautiful and not every day is there time for that kind of space but but i try to make time for that kind of space as often as i can before noon so i'm not up all night long but but i find it to be an incredible uh deliberate uh attentive practice and i know i need more of that in my world another thing that i like to do is hug trees and uh i'm a black woman you can see that <laughs> So I don't have, I mean, may, maybe this is a reason why, but I don't have the kind of relationship with the phrase tree hugger that like it, it can can be. I just like to hug trees. And so um, I, I live in the suburbs like a lot of my classmates and there's a park not far from my home. And particularly when I'm feeling confused or frustrated or in need, uh, I will go out and stand beside a tree and put my hand against it and listen, or like put my arms around it and listen and ask for a lesson. Now, I wanna acknowledge the reality that I'm going to this tree with my hand out, right? I am looking for a thing. I did not bring a gift or an offering to the tree. I am I'm coming and asking for a thing. My hope is that when we are together, um, that what that my presence is an offering, that, that what we are sharing is shared, but I have to think more about that quite candidly. And the third practice that I want to offer is cooking. I love to cook. I, I live a plant-based life or I eat a plant-based diet. That's probably the more accurate way to say that. And so uh, when I am preparing food, all of the food that I gather is made of dirt and time and light and water. And I try to think about that as I'm preparing it, as I'm slicing, as I'm frying or baking or roasting or whatever's happening. And as I'm eating, and as I'm washing, as I'm tending with leftovers, as I'm clearing plates, as I'm composting remains that are no longer edible, again, and, and offering back to the earth what has come from the earth. This is certainly a practice that you can do even if you don't live a plant-based life, right? Um, animals come from the earth, <laughs> just like plants do. Um, and they, they, are, they are made of the earth, just like plants are. And so, being a little more conscious, I think, of where your food is coming from, how it got to you, who has touched it between its sort of inception or creation or um, fruition and your consumption of it, and being grateful for each step of that process and acknowledging when those, when those steps may have caused harm to the people where that food is coming from, to the people who've gathered that food, to the people who brought it to you or, or made it manifest for you, and how you want to respond to that reality. Those are those are some of the ways I am attempting to incorporate this work into my own. Um, Quinn, would you like to go next? Um, sure, I would love to. Um, so actually, I was racking my brain about this, and I think I'm going to give a cliche one first, um, just because I think the fact that it was a cliche made it take forever for it to get through my brain. Um, like literally show up. I think the most important part, and, and this is something I've learned from so many different people and, and experiences, 
the most important part of, of, of being in a relationship with the like, natural world or the environment is just like show up. The more spot time you spend there, the more time you can spend there. That's, that's really the important part, right? It's like, it's like, um, it's like visiting a relative, whether that relative is very old or very young, like what you do when you get there. Yeah, that's important. But like, it's, it's really, it's the company that's important. Um, that's, that's the foundational point. So I, I encourage you, if, if you're going to do absolutely nothing today, do absolutely nothing next to a tree, do absolutely nothing by the ocean. Um, I, I promise you'll be better off. Um, the second one, the second practice, um, I think this is something that I carry with me throughout my different practices. So I was thinking like, this is something I carry with me through Qigong, through um, running, through uh, work with plant medicines and, and it comes partially from a theoretical place and, and I'm going to go quickly because I want to be mindful of time. But um, in Qigong, the, the idea is that um, blood follows your attention. Um, if you breathe and pay attention to a body part, blood will follow that. And that's something that's actually been confirmed in, in medical studies. Um, and I was thinking about that and I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Actually pain, if we think about how pain is, it makes you pay attention to a body part that, that needs actually more resources right now. Um, and in that sense, what has helped me in all of these practices is the sense that of, of paying attention to discomfort, not like sort of dissociating from it as I, I had done in the past for a long period of time, but to actually try to relax into discomfort, whether that's your lungs hurt and your legs hurt because you're running for a long time or you just stubbed your toe. Um, it, it Taking a second to focus on the difficulty and breathe is actually like huge. I mean, it, it, I run farther now because I, because I take this with me. Um, so I, I invite you to do that wherever you are. I think it works for emotional distress as well. I mean, lots of different feelings. Um, and I think it also carries over to when you try to understand something. I think tea is a good example, right? If you really focus on the smell and just like the, the, the orchestra that's happening, it really helps you get to know um, this thing that's in front of you. Um, so that's, that's my second one. And I think I'm blanking on my third one, unfortunately. Um, oh, dreaming. Right. Okay. So, um, I dream constantly. I dream very loudly and very vividly. Um, I, I, for a while, I actually forgot how, and I'm, so I'm, I'm, I guess the practice, if you, if you don't remember your dreams, you have difficulty remembering your dreams. Um, I would invite you to, to spend time when you meet, when you immediately wake up, um, just trying to remember first of all, and then immediately write down whatever you can, even if it's just like a feeling or something, I, I don't care if it's a sentence, a, a single word of doodle. Um, I noticed that something about that uh, makes, I guess, I don't know, your body, your dreams be like, oh, wait, he's actually listening. Like, let's let's turn up the volume a little bit. Um, and, and so that's why I started to really um, remember all of my dreams, actually. And now I go to sleep and I'm just dreaming and then I wake up. Um, and it's been a really great part of my life. I really have learned a lot about myself um, through that. So I, I, I encourage you to, to do that as well. Um, so with that, I will pass it to Sikiko. Wow. Um, thanks, Gwen. <laughs> Very awesome. Yeah, I will pick up on that thread of learning about myself. And since I'm studying this research method called ethnography, which is about um, learning what people do in this very context for a long period of time. And for that to happen, um, it's quite important that who, and it's, it, it's important for me to know who I am so a lot of practices um, that I try to do is about sort of learning who I am. Um, so th three things that I do and I try to do every day is um, walk, learn, and think. And these three are the things that I've been trying. I try to sort of write down at least every day since September um, and see, learn who I am. So walk. So these three things actually mainly come from. Um, three scholars at the Divinity School who have thought about how, what it means to um, live in the plural society, as in it, it, the world that where many different beliefs and non-beliefs um, get together. You know, what does it mean to share experiences and ideas together? Um, and it walk. So the, this idea is more of um, how to figure out how to walk on nothing meaning it, things shift all the time and then a pandemic happened and maybe we're coming out of pandemic, but we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, so to figure out how to walk on nothing, meaning what are the things that make me feel a little bit more like me? 
Um, is it um, breathing? Is it eating? Is it walking outside? Is it talking to my friends? Um, all sorts of things. Then it thinks it things change all the time. But jotting down for me of like, oh, I actually do like this little thing of, you know, this one minute before I have coffee or smelling, um, I don't know, this food that I'm eating or actually anticipating who I'm going to see in a talk today. So walk on nothing is to figure out little things or even big things that I like to do and learn is to realize like what are the things that I'm learning every day um, and who I'm learning from. And it sounds like a very simple thing, but um, unless I make time to actually go over um, what I learned today, I wouldn't necessarily know I learned something. So the point being like it take actually makes time um, to pay attention to what I learned. And at the same time, I want to think. And what is it that I want to think? Who do I want to think? Um, what am I thinking? Um, like, how am I existing today? So um, with that sort of sense of gratitude and then trying to figure out how I exist today, um, yeah, I think. So I guess I'll turn it back to you, Natalia. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful note to end this uh, little portion on. Gratitude is a, a word that we have used so many times in our conversations and in our discussions around, especially what can we give back? Um, that's a really hard question often to think about. What do we give back to a world that in our in a you know in this current period that people are labeling as the Anthropocene what do we give to a world that seems like it would be very happy and healthy without us in it and I think we need to dismantle that thought because we're a part of this world and so I think gratitude as well as um, acts of protection acts of um, uh, work co-evolution co-creation recognizing uh, sentience uh, um changing our laws, changing our culture. There's lots of things that could be done, but I think gratitude is at the basis of many of these things is recognizing how much we are given by our planet and how, how integrated we are within our planet. Like uh, all of us have mentioned waste and relationships. So down to what our relationships look like and that, that those relationships are often built on, um, built on our or should be built on our gratitude for that being's existence or that body's existence sorry that was my dog um so okay we're at 4 38 so i want to be mindful of time and say that i think maybe we should just go ahead and get started with the q a session um because i'm sure we will all dive back into discussion as we're, as we're answering. So thank you, Ariel. Welcome back. <laughs> Wonderful. So that's been, it's been a very interesting discussion. And I can see that we have a lot of really good questions coming in, which I think will also lead to some great discussion. Um, looking at these questions, I feel like we may not have time to answer all of them, but we will do our best. So one question that was asked is, uh, what words of vocabulary do you recommend we rethink shift to when we talk about ecology and the earth? This is such a good question. Thank you. Um, I believe Rebecca asked that question. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, well, there are First, there's a lot of writing, pre-existing writing that talks about the way that pronouns are used and how we label, um, I mean, personhood is often dictated by what pronouns are used. Are we using the word it to describe a being that's part of an ecosystem who's impacting us and who's impacting the beings around that being? Um, there are some fantastic authors that uh, like Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, David Abram. Um, I'm happy to send a, a list around if you're interested Please feel free to write me and I can, we can send you a bibliography of people who talk about language specifically, but um, that would be my offering in, into that question is think about pronouns and uh, whether or not you're acknowledging someone, uh, someone, a tree, a plant's agency within that space and relationships in that space. I'm so glad you're speaking on this, Natalia, um, because you are the right person to speak on this. I, uh, hi, Rebecca. <laughs> um, I, 
recently read a chapter from Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer about this very thing uh, in another community that I was in. Um, and I, I think I just want to highlight it because I've just, I just, I, I deal in language. I have an MFA in creative writing. I'm a writer. And so uh, I love thinking about what uh, like what I am using language to do and not to do and who I am lang using language to see and to make invisible or to erase um, and why. Uh, and, and so there's a chapter in her text about the language. Uh, I don't want to, I'm going to get it wrong, so I'm not going to name it. Um, but, but specifically like what it means for a body of water to be a body of water or what it means to be a Saturday or like the ways in which nouns and verbs sort of exist in a native language that are very different in English. Um, and and so uh, that chapter in specific, I think is really lovely and resonant about this. Um, I also want to lift up uh, a phrase that I heard in a panel that I was just in, and I know you were there too, Rebecca, um, I, to consent not to be a single being. Like when Dr. Tani Thomas offered that into the space, it landed on my heart tangibly, viscerally. Um, and so I wrote it down because I want to ask myself as often as possible, what does it mean to consent not to being a single being in community with my classmates, colleagues, teachers, faculty, administrators, in community with the street and the grass and the sunshine and the rain and the trees that I go out and stand beside in community with the leaves in this bowl and the water in this bowl and the steam in the air between the two, between my face and the bowl, right? So, so like, how do we allow our sense of being to expand, not in a, a sort of colonialist, like, I'm going to become all of the things and make them all mine and me, but, but like, how, what is it like if we put ourselves, if we imagine ourselves in another being, in another space, in another way of embodiment, um, and how might we consider our own actions in that way of being or embodiment? How do we relate to ourselves if we can if we can actually conceptually put ourselves in two places at once? And how do we talk about that being or speak to that being if we can put ourselves in more than one place at a time? I mean, I'm not we can't I haven't figured out how to do it much as I've tried, but but like I can't literally be more than one person at a time or in more than one place at a time. And yet thinking this way makes me want to be better. And I want to add to just because, um, Anna Natalia's, I think it, Kimura asks, does the nature love you back? As in, human beings are very much part of uh, ecology. And I think Natalia pointed out, but I think it, one word I would want to sort of highlight is interconnectedness. So we already are part of this. And then so to sort of pay attention to how are we part of it is one thing. And I think what Kimmer also offers is to think about things in terms of verbs. Um, and I think one thing she highlights is 70% of native language um, words are verbs. So when we, so the way to think about like tree, um, it's breathing or it's eating. And then that might be a sort of a one way to look at yeah, this world. So we had another great question from Barbara who asks, do you feel hopeful that we can possibly save marine mammals by providing or having them characterized as highly intelligent, um, that they have emotions and intelligence like humans? And if there was a ladder, so to speak, of species that deserve to be protected? I think I think I could speak to this a little bit. This is like a fantastic question. Um, and and for for reference, there's people who are pushing for certain animals, dolphins, I think maybe even octopuses to be registered as non-human persons because they're just they're so intelligent um, that it really it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense when we talk about personhood to make them not persons, right? Um, and I I personally am. Uh, I think it's extremely important to recognize the intelligence, the, the extreme intelligence um, of these of these animals, and and the ways in which different beings can have intelligence that overlaps with ours. I you know I look to racial studies, and I'm I'm a little worried about that. Um, 
just in the sense that, right, if you, uh, we've struggled for so long, um, minorities have struggled for so long to be categorized as people um, because the idea is that they will be treated better and we will solve all these problems that we have when, when, when they're recognized as people. And we, and we see that it's not so conceptual, right? When we, even, even when people are registered as legal people, the, the, the mechanisms by which they were abused initially are still running fine. Um, and it doesn't really, in my opinion, um, solve that problem while it can make huge steps and give us vocabulary to start to work on these problems. So I don't think that's enough in and of itself. Um, though I applaud the efforts of people who are trying to get um, these, these animals recognized as non-human persons. I, I also worry for, I think, you know, um, I mean, is a colony of bees? That's that's a lot of intelligence when you put them all together. Are we going to, like, just because the individ individual bee isn't intelligent, are they not worth, you know, protecting? Where do we draw the line? I don't really want to draw that line personally. Um, but that's just my initial thoughts. I don't know if anybody else has any. Yeah, I'm going to jump in after that real quick because, Quinn, first of all, thank you for bringing that up. It was really, really important um, and an important part of the discussions around personhood um, legally. Um, so I think... One of the reasons why spirituality or our religious belief systems are, are is important when talking about um, sentience and personhood and intelligence is first to say that nothing is more intelligent than something else. It's just intelligent in its own way. Um, our my intelligence is very different from some another human's intelligence, which is very different from my dog's intelligence, which is different from a squirrel's intelligence, and so on and so forth. We do what we what we do in our ecosystems. Um, but we have so much data and so many different scientists who are talking about sentience and talking about relationships and communication down to how plants communicate with each other. And we have this data now, and yet is the culture changing? And I think that is where our belief systems come in because if our, um, so often as, as we've seen in our political climate as well, so often people, vote or engage with whatever their environment is through their belief system in some way. And so it's important, I think, to look to spiritual leaders who are willing to engage with environmental activism, such as the um, Buddhist monks in Thailand working to uh, ordain trees in order to protect them and really working on the ground level. Um, there's an anthropologist, Susan Darlington, who wrote a book about this called The Ordination of a Tree that really gets into the minutia of that kind of a movement and why uh, a spiritual belief system is central in many ways to shifting culture. Um, and so I think to build off of what Quinn said, it, it's, it's, we don't, it's not enough to recognize the sentience because there's so much data, it's already there. It's just the culture change and that in so many ways comes through appealing to people's empathy, appealing to their, um, their own personal relationships and looking at like, oh, well, you treat this animal this way. Why wouldn't you treat this animal? This way, or you believe your dog goes to heaven, but that doesn't that doesn't fit within a hegemonic Christian ontology. So how do you um, how do you step aside from from those? So I'll, I'll leave. It there. Uh, no, you don't have to, Natalia. Um, so Natalia and I have a class together, and and we met last night in class, and 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 she mentioned this text, the ordination of a tree, and in the context of this class, we talked somewhat somewhat a classmate of ours also talked about a text called Undrowned. Natalia, do you remember the name of the writer of that book? I've not read it. I have it somewhere. Go ahead and keep talking and I'll find I, it. I don't have a ton of things to say about it. Like I wanted to make two comments and that was the first is I wanted to lift that up. It is a text that explores like family shapes and dynamics among marine mammals uh, uh, against or not against, but beside black womanist theology and theory. And I put it on my list because it sounds dope. So um, that might be a useful place. I think uh, Barbara is the person who asked this question. So that might be a useful place, Barbara, as you're considering how you are thinking about marine life. Um, and I'm about to make this really messy with the second thing that I wanted to bring up is that um, in a, another shared space that Natalia and I've been in, we've been talking about this language of personhood and how, thank you, um, how, uh, how it has often been, and not deliberately not to center Christianity, but how it has often been used by religious political movements um, to undermine things like personal choice. And what does it mean for, what does it mean for the way that we use language and personhood to protect all of life? 
I guess. I, I'm not, it's just so hard to talk about. I'm not great at talking about this. If you, the, like my classmates and colleagues know that I am a, I'm a big reproductive justice advocate, ally, um, yeah, whatever the right noun is. Um, and so I want to be really clear that like in as much as I advocate really clearly for uh, a radical reframing of the way that we use language to hold space for the natural world, I also will not allow it to be used to remove reproductive choice for folks, for biped folks who can reproduce. Excellent. So, yes, I was about to mention that Cheryl asked a great question and her question, um, sorry, let me just quickly find that here. Um, her question is, would you comment on genus Loki and the concept that people belong to a land rather than land belonging to people? Um, and how do you ensure you connect to the spirit of the land you encounter? Who wants to take this? Otherwise, I'm ready to dive in. <laughs> um, that is such an excellent question, especially as a descendant of a colonizer, um, our colonizer culture and settler, uh, settler guilt. I mean, that we're dealing with how do we connect with land that has been so deeply ravaged and the, um, the indigenous population have been and continue to be displaced and continue to be marginalized and their sovereignty taken away. Um, how do we connect with those? That goes back to the practices that I, I, or I believe it goes back to the practices that we discussed. There are ways to support uh, your local native nation. There are ways to sit and be quiet and look at your surroundings and to pay attention to who's growing and who they're interacting with and what that, what's happening in that ecosystem. And the genius loci, I mean, that is in many ways what religion, especially paganism is, is looking at how space affects belief system and how ritual follows that space. Um, and many aspects of Christianity as it's, as it's been proselytized, as it's moved in um, alongside empire, uh, have picked up those genius loci and turned them, uh, turned them into saints, turned them into um, holy figures within that, that local community's belief system. Um, and so engaging with them specifically, I mean, it's very personal, right? And it's very much about um, looking at your relationship with that land, um, but also acknowledging whose land it is um, and being, whether that's economically supportive of that indigenous nation, or um, again, looking at the nonprofits in your area who are working towards conservation, working towards waste management, waste reduction. Um, and then also, I think one way besides meditating with plants um, and with genius loci um, is to, uh, and I should probably define that term for those who don't know what that means. Genius loci is the spirit of a space. So if you're in a specific forest or a specific grove or um, specific, any kind of land, land has spirit uh, in, in certain traditions and uh, this, that spirit is called the genius loci. So and there's uh, that genius look I has developed alongside the people who have evolved in that space. Um, and so if the people are harmed or displaced, that genius loci is also harmed and displaced. Um, and so in order to create a connection and to, uh, to support that relationship, you have to look at the people. Social justice is inherently tied to environmental justice. And um, we can't say that we're doing wonderful things for our local ecosystem if the Native nations are being um, further marginalized by our actions. Um, so that's my perspective as a descendant of colonizers, but um, that's, I'm also very open to hearing what everyone else feels and thinks about that. I think I'll add a sort of really spend time with the land and pay attention in it. How does it feel like three in the morning and is it different at nine at night or um, how is it in April as opposed to in December? Um, and I think that there are just so many different things that happen 
and land. Um, and then how does it smell in the morning as opposed to in the midday? Like, it, does it smell differently? Uh, what are the kind of things that you touch in and like, does it feel the same in the middle of summer as opposed to winter? So I think it, that sort of personal thing, it does um, help sort of understand what that genius look like means to the original or uh, you know the people who actually have really strong connection with that particular piece of line. Thank you so much for that. That was so beautiful. Um, I think I, I want to add to that a little bit. Um, I think, and this is the million dollar question for me. I was talking to my friend. She's um, she uh, is is white, and she's trying to start a subsistence farm. She's really struggling with this. Like, this is something that she is is having a lot of problems with. Um, so, I want to invite like anyone to sit with that difficulty. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to feel uncomfortable. I mean, it feels uncomfortable for me, and uh, you know, that's that's maybe if we sit with it longer, we'll come up with something. Um, I do want to echo what Natalia said, or, or kind of add to it. I. I someone told me that when they do uh, uh, um, a ceremony with with plant medicine they actually offer a little bit to the to the earth first and to the spirits that that, that tend to the earth and say this is for you and and um they actually wait for permission to start um and and i don't know how to de like developing that sense of, of of knowing what the answer is um or when you get permission is is one thing but um, I think it, it at least the action reminds you that you're only here uh, with the permission in the sense of the land, uh, your reflection of the land. And, and you know, uh, it's supporting you. Like if you jump, you're going to get back down to the land There's a connection, whether you like it or not. Um, so so I, that would be the only thing I would add. Wonderful. So I think. We have a lot of amazing questions, and unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all of them today. But I'd like our, our attendees to know that our panelists have seen all of your questions. So they're definitely things that they are now thinking about. So thank you for submitting all of them. And I think we have time for one more question. And because a lot of people are very interested in resources to think about um, for themselves, maybe we could answer this question uh, from Janice, which is, would each of you recommend a favorite author or book? on ways to connect to nature, ecology, and spiritual practice? I think some of us might have the same one, um, but Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass is a wonderful place to start. Um, there are many, many authors in many different traditions. There's even Christian animist perspectives. If, you're, if you are a Christian and you are interested in learning about um, how to engage with your very alive environment. Um, Mark Wallace's uh, book, uh, When God Was a Bird, is a really wonderful place to start. But I think even in my work outside of um, school, uh, when, I'm, when I'm working as an herbalist, when I'm speaking to people about their plant allies, the first book I always suggest is read Robin Malkimura's work. I asked Natalia the same question in the midst of my like onset of this awakening, like, oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I read? Uh, which is, which also feels like a very Harvard question. What book should I read about this? Um, and, and Natalia told me about one that I haven't yet read, but again, is right at the top of my list about like, the secret life of trees. Is that what it's called? Um, uh, Hidden World of Trees by Peter Volubon. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, also The Secret Life of Plants, but that one has some hazy science in it. So I would do The uh, the Hidden World of Trees. I'm really excited about that one. Um, I, I I was shifting because there's so many like possible answers to this. Um, I really like the poet um, C.A. Conrad. I don't know if any of you guys know them. Um, yeah, I, they have this book, Eco Deviance, which is their second most recent book. They came out with a recent one I haven't read yet. Um, but I love their poetry and they are, are very specific about practices and giving you practices that you can do now, um, like just intro level. Um, and, uh, you know, I, so I really like them. Um, Everyone, I, I haven't read this yet, but so many people that I love have suggested this to me, so I'm just going to pass it to you. Um, the Mushroom at the End of the World by, and, and I'm trying to remember, it, it, I can't remember the author. Um, yeah, every single human has recommended me this book, so I, I'm going to be reading it soon, and, and maybe you can join me in that. And I... 
I used to be a piano tuner. I used to be a farmer. I used to be a landscaper. I I wouldn't go for a book. <laughs> I um, I just go outside, even in the city. You might not see any plant. Um, go outside and walk around. And if you don't walk or cannot walk, um, sit and I see what you notice. And that's what I would say might be the book that I recommend. <laughs> well, thank you to all our panelists. These are wonderful recommendations. I want to try reading some of these books now. Um, thank you for all of the wonderful questions we got. And thank you to our panelists for sharing so much of themselves and their practices tonight. So thank you again and have a great evening. Bye everyone. <laughs>